Hello, so I'm just, uh, I'm Andrea Perry. Uh, good morning. I have my cup of tea to hand. I hope that you do as well. I'm just waiting for a different number of participants to come into the meeting and then we will make a start. So good morning. The sunny one here, I am in South London. I don't know where you are, but it's sunny in South, South London at the moment. So we'll just wait and see if we've got any more people coming in just for a minute or two and then I'll I'll get going. So I'd like to just say thank you to Nicole and to Sarah who set up this program uh, for inviting me to speak. I was contributing to, to EPNET, the Educational Psychologists Network on email with some comments about going back into schools and the kind of transitions really that might, or kinds of experiences that people might be taking back into schools. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I wanted to stress that I come very much from an attachment and trauma informed perspective as an integrative psycho psycho psychotherapist. I'm not an educational psychologist, I'm an integrative psychotherapist, but I've worked in the field of supporting people through trauma and supporting people through crisis for a long time now. Um, I work for a major charity that does that. And um, I also have worked uh, in Iraq, so supporting people in post-conflict zones. So I'd like to just share some of the things that I have found that uh, may be helpful and useful and share some thoughts about some of the experiences that may be around for people from an attachment, an attachment aware, trauma responsive perspective. And I hope it will be helpful for you. So I'm gonna share my screen and here we go. So meeting the ripples of trauma with hope, clear thinking, and I would like to say, usually in my case, a cup of tea. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at. I tend to talk very fast, so it's a good thing this is being recorded. I think there is an awful lot to say. I've been really inspired by some of the other presentations on this educational psychology reach out. So if you've been watching some of those, you may find some overlap, and I think that's great. I think it's wonderful when we all find out that our thinking is integrated in this way. So the kinds of things that I'm going to be looking at today, let's just move on if I can. Okay, this is what I'm gonna have a look at. I'm going to look at traumatic events in general. I'm gonna look at the role and uncertainty, what's known as ambiguous loss and grief play in, the, in situations of trauma. Um, I think it's very interesting because there's so much uncertainty around at the moment. And we understand a lot, I think, about the patterns and pathways of loss as we understand it, what we call maybe finite loss, loss where it's very, very clear. But in times of uncertainty, the ambiguity around losses that we all experience is heightened to an extraordinary degree. So we'll be looking at that. And also the role of shame, because actually I think that shame is not much being spoken about, but I think that there will be a great deal of shame. And if we understand in advance some of the dynamics around that, um, I think that would be very helpful. Always because of it's, this is an attachment approach, we need to look at the relational approach and the sort of the different things that may help uh, and in, including the narrative, how we speak about this, how we speak about each of the phases, how we speak about our own experience and how we encourage the children and young people that we work with to speak about their experience as well is so, so incredibly important. And finally, to look at intrinsic hope. And I'm afraid I'm a great bibliophile, so I should be directing you towards uh, some online courses, which I'm part of, and also some reading material. Um, <clears throat> and I want to show you this picture in the first instance. I've put safe space at the top. And to me, this picture is a garden that um, I helped to create and was very familiar with for a long time. So just the lavender there, actually, it looks like a rough old field, but lots of lavender anyway. And that's such an important image for me because I have that inside me. It's not just something that I can look at, it's something inside me where I can go as a safe place. And I would encourage you throughout this presentation to think about your safe spaces as well, because when we're trying to keep our own thinking clear, we need to go back into a safe space inside ourselves so that we can find an anchor there, we can find stability there, we can find affirmation and indeed hope back in the places where we know uh, that we can access something that enriches us, soothes us, reassures us, our own internal secure base. 
So this is part of mine, but I would really uh, encourage you. I know that Nicole in one of her presentations talked about perhaps having an image of something to do with nature. So many of us gravitate towards nature, but not all. Um, but having an image nearby, if you can just have that, even if you're on your desk, if you're doing lots of work from home or somewhere nearby, you can look out of the window at the sky, as Nicole said, just so, so very helpful. Okay, let's go on. So stormy seas and crises. So the kind of range of traumatic events and crises, if we're thinking about that in general, obviously we know that they include natural disasters. If we think about the hurricanes and the earthquakes, we think about accidents, which obviously could, for example, affect one member of a school community, or it could affect many people, and indeed it can affect a whole community. So prior to this uh, epidemic, then obviously we had the floods, which affected individual uh, children in their families, it affected the family group, and it affected whole communities being evacuated and not allowed to go back into their homes. Some of them I, I still think of today, where there are going to be people in those communities who may be self-isolating in homes that were flooded, and, and somehow that moves me deeply that those circumstances have been compounded. Then we have epidemics, and I'll look at the moment about what worries pupils. Epidemics hasn't in this country um, so far been something that we've thought about. Obviously, if you live in a country where Ebola was rife, I imagine that children would list epidemics amongst the traumas that they were aware of, but we'll see. So, And then incidents with violence. I live in South London. Unfortunately, it's a uh, there have been many stabbings here. Fortunately, that's gone down now, but we know that that creates a lot of trauma around a school environment if it's happened outside or if it's happened to an individual within that community. Again, that can involve the whole collective of a, of a school community, but it can involve the wider community as well. Social upheaval also comes into the category of traumatic events and crises. And all of these things, in terms of the impact on any of us, are affected by how big it is, how long it lasts, who else is involved, is it just us, or is it, are we surrounded by others? And of course, all our experiences are very, very individual, even though there's that collective sense as well. So um, it also depends on communication resources. Of course, in this particular crisis, the communication is stellar, um, <laughs> but not for everyone. Everybody. We know there's a lot of children and young people who enjoined to get on with their, uh, their study at home, maybe having to share one laptop if they're lucky or a dodgy internet connection, um, you know, and so that's going to have a massive differential effect on different families. The resources and communication are not equally distributed in our society by any means. And then there's the role of the media, the media who can variously uh, um, either support or attack those who are steering us through this or are directing us through this and they can also perpetuate myths or try to get to the truth about what is happening and all of those stories are filtered through the adults who are currently surrounding the children and young people who you're going to be working with. So we, we have to be aware, of course, that we're in a series of bubbles, actually, not just in the bubble of the family home, but at the moment that mitigation of the media message is coming through the family unit in a way that uh, it doesn't normally happen. Normally schools will be mitigating a media message as well. But at the moment, that filter is much, much tighter around the home environment and who that family is in touch with. So there's going to be so many different narratives coming back into school um, and we'll look later on at the impact of that. So prior to the crisis, the worries before COVID-19, this is a kind of, um, these are some of the things that you're all too familiar with. I was involved in some of the work uh, as there many school councillors were, but in another capacity I was involved after Grenfell Tower. But these are some of the things that people were really, really worried about and that actually had effects on children, of course, children and young people. These are some of the worries that were rated uh, for Generation Z. These are some of the worries that were rated before the crisis. So you look here, uh, down at the bottom, sexual assault and harassment, separation and deportation of immigrant and migrant families, children being worried about those things when they've had lessons on uh, the refugee experience and then waking up worried that they're going to have to leave home as well. Children at that level where they can't quite differentiate fantasy and reality, they can't quite differentiate between there and here and their senses that if that could happen to any family at any time, could it happen to me as well? So a worry for some children. 
climate change, I think this probably has, has risen. The, the fact that there are shootings, this is an American survey, that that was also very worrying for children in school, feeling, can't I even uh, go into school and feel safe? So all of these things have been very worrying and stressful for those, uh, for that generation. But now, of course, coming into COVID, there are many other worries for people. And so we have a whole new layer and level of, of concern. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but people have been uh, generating Fs like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> there is no tomorrow. So we've always thought classically about fight, flight and freeze in terms of a reaction to, to trauma. And in those early stages, and my goodness, if you know, we're all having a lived experience of going through the different stages of a trauma, aren't we? So um, in that early stage, fight, flight and freeze is obviously around. It's the headless chicken phase for those people who tend to go towards flight or actually chickens. No, chickens can fly, can they? Or can they only hop? I don't know. But fight, flight and freeze. We know that as a classic thing. And of course, that's activation of different parts of the nervous system. But mm, people have started to choose in English anyway, other words beginning with F to friend. So we're always being encouraged to connect. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the, the clangers five ways to well-being that the new economics foundation um, the, a little while ago the new economics foundation was asked to work on to un understand five ways to well-being like we have the five uh, fruit and vegetables that are good for us every day so five ways to well-being that you may be familiar with it's, it's really wonderful and they came up with this acronym clang uh, the first is communicate l is learn a is get active n is notice which i love and g is give and so the c is being connect is to friend as a, as a reaction in a stressful situation let's friend so it's a very healthy constructive uh um thing to do in a crisis and of course now reach out connect make connections the very thing that we're doing this morning is is such a good good thing to do in a in a crisis and from an attachment perspective it's the absolutely securely attached response which is to okay how do I access my secure base so I'm thinking back to my lavender picture please think about your secure base how do I how do I reach out connect to my to my people but these other responses can kick in as well like the flocking which is a bit like everyone rushing off in their panic reaction to oh he's buying lots of loo paper or she's buying lots of this I better get it as well all those things people will wonder why they've got 37 years worth of loo paper stuck in their, their cupboards. And again, this pertains to the narrative that the family will have been through. What will the family have done? Will the family have tried to fight back and said, it doesn't really matter, let's go out and have parties, it's being over-exaggerated, or will the family fly into um, pre-existing obsessive tendencies around everything's got to be scrupulously clean, you've got to completely take off your clothes at the door, don't come in, don't make this house contaminated, we don't know, we don't know, but we know that diverse reactions will have been kicking in and will continue to kick in uh, with different uh, family members. The one at the bottom here is for you to generate your next F. What else happens during a crisis? There are many other things. I think in only in English could we keep generating ones that began with F, but there are many different reactions. Some you've probably noticed in yourselves, some you'll have noticed in other people, but that's, and then of course, as the crisis goes on, different experiences come through and we know that an impact of a trauma especially an extended one like this or a traumatic crisis or an event it continues so it has all these different impacts as time goes on but then what we need to think about is this uncertainty and ambiguous loss so in the in a situation of a simple simple event like um, I travel down to Brighton and suddenly all the trains are cancelled because there's some pro problem around uh, Horsham and the, the, the line is interrupted. And when that happens, what happens is all those F reactions, people start flocking around the one person with a uniform on that might have some information. People start getting exasperated and insisting that they're the person who's got to get somewhere, so they're fighting. Other people look a bit frozen and helpless and don't know what to do. Other people kind of go, okay, I'm going to some nice Zen position. Um, but basically we're all facing uncertainty and I'm sure we've all been in a situation as we are now, where in, in, a, in a minor way, where people say, for example, on a train that has stopped, um, 
we don't know what's happening right now. We'll come back and let you know in a couple of minutes whether we have any information. They're not saying we'll come back in a couple of minutes and tell you what's actually happening. They're saying we'll come back and tell you if we have had an update by then. If they reliably come back and tell us, that will be very helpful, even if they don't have any information. The fact that they have promised that they will come back and tell us whether they have more information or not, that is the key element, that they reliably continue to do what they say they're going to do. So even in the face of uncertainty, there are things we can do to establish the reliable, secure base that is so necessary for the children and young people that we live with and work with to feel more secure. Because currently we are surrounded by uncertainty and we're surrounded by ambiguous loss. So just to explain a bit more about what that means, ambiguous loss is one that remains clear, unclear and has no closure. So it can either be physical or it could be psychological or it could be both. So for example, it could be some of these things, loved ones. We don't know all the time where the people that we care about are or they might be in hospital and we can't speak with them. Some of the families will be having that terrible experience. We don't know what's going to happen to them. We've had, we have an ambiguous loss around the life as it was. And some families may be telling the story that of course it's going to go back to how it was. Others are absolutely convinced it's never going to be the same again. The, sh the shape of our community has changed. Some say it will be better. Some say it won't be better. We just don't know at the moment. And of course, there are many, many worries about the future. And we may have had some um, unspoken belief that we did know where the future was going, although climate change has obviously dampened that to a massive extent. But we have lots of questions about it. And again, identity and role. Some of the children will be in families where jobs have been lost. And what was a very secure path may now be completely shattered. The hope for a satisfying and productive future. You know, I've actually, I wrote this list some time ago when I started to first find out about ambiguous loss. The phrase was coined by a woman called Pauline Boss, who did a lot of work in the, uh, she's been working on this for a long, long time, and her book was published in 2000. It's on the book list later on. But um, I can't believe that I wrote this list really some time back, and yet, in a way, all of these things are uh, encompassed in the, in the current situation, which in its way is kind of also affirming. So we can all... Uh, experience it. The really important thing here is that the reactions to it are um, in the in are different to an ordinary loss because they have something around how moving between these polarities of hope and resistance. So you might some people foreclose and say it'll definitely be fine. It definitely won't be fine. But actually, staying with the not knowing is really the challenge. And that can be a very paralyzing position because it's very hard to build on uncertainty. It's very hard to build on shifting sand. So our goal when we're working with people and children and adolescents, especially in terms of the narrative that we have is to be accepting of the uncertainty like the train, but and to honor to honor what we've lost to honor what we have in the moment and to try to find meaning and to build resilience around it because we can't control that part. And we need to be able to differentiate. And I think one of the other speakers here um, earlier in the week was talking about um, the difference there about what we can control and what we can't control to build resilience around these question marks inside us in a way and to expand our experience of what can be enriching in the present, what we actually can do to refine hope and optimism. So these are some of the, the impacts that they that they can have in terms of the impact of uncertainty, the impact of ambiguous loss. It leads to anxiety. And what we know, of course, is that um, anxiety drives behavior that can be deemed challenging. And so all of these things here on the right, uh, it can drive regressive behaviors. So those early attachments, early insecure attachments get exacerbated. Executive functioning can be reduced. Uh, blaming and splitting, we're seeing that happening all over the place, although there is a, a, a core that's holding. Pre-existing vulnerabilities, especially for children who have high incidence of ACEs already, this anxiety can rev those things up. And as I say, um, in terms of responsibility, people can either take too much on themselves or too little. But the other one, the final one that I want to look at before I turn to some of the more positive things is around shame. Because 
shame. If we regress, we may feel shame because things that we thought we could do previously, we can't do. We may feel shame because the narrative our family gave us isn't the same as other people's narratives. And why I feel it's so important when the children come back into school that there's a real sense of everyone there has survived, they've done something, and that everybody will have some skills and strengths that they have been able to use. How did this family cope? How did they manage? They will to celebrate something from everybody. Everybody can contribute something, even those families where people don't feel they've done very well through this time and have suffered hugely something will be there that they can be identified and reframed as that's a that's a that's a strategy that's something your family did that's what you all did together because the shame shame is insidious and shame and anxiety together is toxic so we need to find all sorts of ways i think to be able to keep establishing those secure relationships re-establishing secure relationships to build a platform to acknowledge the challenges that people are carrying and the children and adolescents are carrying but to really reduce the level of shame because shame and anxieties are such triggers for and reduce executive functioning such triggers for really challenging behavior that if that gets you know misunderstood and not worked with from an attachment aware or trauma-informed perspective can be a real recipe for, for problems in all domains of society and in schools perhaps in particular. So this is really very core for me. This uh, comes from a service, psychosocial service specific group report. Um, and this one here, the carer will look to their caregiver to define the level of threat. They will mirror how they see their caregiver responding, which is why going back to our secure place, we need to be able to, to stay calm and stay hopeful and stay optimistic in the face of uncertainty. As adults, we've had experiences of working through uncertainty, of living with ambiguous losses. You don't get to be the ages that we are without having lived through losses and ambiguity and being able to convey that sense of, yes, this is hard. Yes, this is challenging. And yes, we're going to be all right. We'll be all right. And we will work with this and we will find ways of doing this. And how interesting that you've been able to do that. That's well, how did you do that? Tell me how you did it. Being curious and being empathic, which, of course, leads me neatly on to if you're aware of these uh, of those the, the core elements of those words. Uh, the necessary foundation of relationships to provide secure attachment in schools with and such people as Louise Bomber, Mari Delaney, Dan Hughes, Margot Sunderland. I'm the, the, uh, the chair of conference at the Centre for Child Mental Health. And it's just so great to be able to think that all of the things that people have been saying now for such a long time, they are so, so valid, so valuable for us. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk, for example, comes to mind, and Dan Siegel and John Bailey, and all these great people. The resources are there. We know what we need to do, and we know that we can do it. So these core elements, playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy, are just so critical. They're critical always, um, but they're really critical at this, this time. But I would like to add in the tolerance of ambiguity. Because if we can really develop our own tolerance around ambiguity, and that's not easy, it's not easy. No one ever said it was going to be easy. But if we can, that is a huge gift to children and, and to adolescents. Because if they have someone alongside them who can say, I don't know either. Do you know what? I don't know. And doesn't feel impelled to give an answer and say definitely this and definitely that. If we can tolerate that, we can help them to build their tolerance. And we can help them to build a life where we do what we're going to do because it's the right thing to do and because it's what we need and want to do. But we can find ways to deal with the, with the uncertainty. So we need to be story listeners as well as story makers, which is um, a, a book comes from a book called Community Resilience, which I'll show you later on and is really um, a really great resource. Um, but I would really encourage that. We're not just a story maker in terms of reframing things around for children and adolescents, but we also need to profoundly listen to their stories and acknowledge and validate all the different elements and help to reinforce their self-esteem and their self-efficacy, their sense of self-efficacy by really looking for the strengths, looking for the strengths in every family, in every family, the children's strengths as well as the family strengths. 
So here's my real core takeaway from this. We can't help people tolerate ambiguity beyond our own tolerance of ambiguity. So this is the work we could all be doing right now to strengthen ourselves around living with uncertainty, neither foreclosing into the totally negative or holding on to the, someone once called it the toxic insincerity of Pollyanna, <laughs> not going to either of those polarities, but sitting with uncertainty, sitting with the we don't know, but we can be okay not knowing, we can go and put the kettle on or what in my case usually but there's so much we can do even when we don't know so i'm going to leave you in a moment so we can go to some questions but here we are at the bottom everything that we do when we go back um, is going to be really based on this underpinned by secure attachment relationships yes we need to carry on but we can't carry on regardless we do need to normalize all the different feelings and say yes all of these feelings responses are natural and perhaps put in some psychoeducation around brains and how we all function and how all of us are impacted by these things routine is critical and supportive and provides a structure and reassurance when it's honest not when we don't know but what so if someone's oh i'm feeling really awful with these things yeah it is awful that's an honest reassurance it is horrid I just want to follow the track that goes to watchful waiting and securing specialist support. Of course, there will be children and they may come more to your attention than anybody else, along with other uh, colleagues from CAMS teams. We need to watch out for the, the, the young children, the children and the young people who are really going to be, I'm afraid, very damaged by this. But be watchful waiting because we will have to wait to see how it emerges. Some people, there may be a delay with some people as well. And the co-constructing of meaning. There's so many different elements for all of these, and I'll explain to you in a moment where you can find out more about them. I'd just like to recommend this book, finally. It's a book that constantly inspires me. This is by a woman called Kate Davis. She's a climate activist, and these are her six ways of maintaining intrinsic hope, which I hope that I've been speaking about all the time, really. That is our role, to be able to live with ambiguity and uncertainty and to maintain hope, not an ungrounded hope, but just the hope that is the hope that says, OK, so we'll just do the next right thing. We'll do the thing that we know is the one that is going to move, improve things now and that will lay the foundation for greater security and greater responsiveness for the future. So here's our final quote. This is from Kennedy. Each time a man or a woman, Mr. Kennedy, you should have said, each time a woman or a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy <clears throat> and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And I would say, and also of uncertainty and fearfulness, especially at this time. So let's be ones who send out tiny ripples of hope. There's a enough tiny ripples of trauma coming the other way and big ones so let's be the, the generators of tiny ripples of hope. So here's a little book list for you if you can watch the thing again you can see my, one of my books is there Perry A claustrophobia I wrote a book about claustrophobia a while back which I have to say has got stuff in it which is kind of useful right now um, and there's a new book coming out by Louise Bomber, Know Me to Teach Me um, and other books that um, we could talk about another time perhaps, but lots of good stuff there. And the one that is called um, Omidayan, here we are, Reaching Resilience, a training manual. I think you might find that immensely helpful at this time in working with the whole school community. And finally, I'd just like to tell you about this. This is Course We Do, which is my one of my organizations. And if you want to know more about the course that I was referring to there, the trauma in school, it's here. So you could just go to Course We Do, or you can email Lucy, who is down here at the bottom. And I've put my contact details there so that you can contact me if you need to. And so if I do stop share, I think I can now look at the Q&A. It's a little one. Ah, someone says, I'm struck by the fact that we need to ensure adults, parents and staff are feeling resilient to be in a good position to support our young people. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So maybe some of the questions here are going to be about how do you support the staff? I would really recommend that book by Omi Dion on um, community resilience. I would really recommend that book because I think that really gives the opportunity to have a conversation with whole groups of people. And there are lots of exercises and things in it as well, lots of activities to be able to surface their strengths and to surface their ways of internally supporting themselves and getting support externally. And I think that's at all levels, parents, carers, teachers, 
all of those people are going to need you to support their resilience um, to, to go through these next phases. And the next one says, oh, pretty much the same thing. How can we uh, support parents and those in educational settings to feel resilient in to be in a space to help them to step out of their homes and back into society, into educational settings? Yes. Um, I was watching um, a video from Lisa Cherry the other day, and some I think she was saying, yes, how, do, how does this school want to see itself uh, surviving and thriving and adapting? How does this school want to, to feel that it's doing it? But being able to find out the stories within the different families as well, that how have those families managed to uh, establish a narrative around it so that there's something in each child who could be proud of how their family has done this. And that of course, there are going to be families where things have been absolutely terrible. But if family has kind of stayed together in some way or another, something somewhere will be something that the child can take forward. And so, yes, working with groups of people and looking after the adults is going to be by far the most important thing. And that starts with you. So I hope that you will find ways to strengthen your own resilience, to look after your own uh, sense of stability at this time and always. And I think we probably need to finish. So I'm not sure quite what's going to happen next, but uh, thank you very much for watching. And I hope you have a good day today. And I look forward to seeing more of these recordings. Thank you to Nicole and to Sarah for starting again, for starting this whole process. Bye-bye.